Please help me welcome Craig Nippenberg. Thank you very much, Karina. Thank you. And I got to meet her daughter, and she's delightful and lovely. And I also, in the excitement of being here today, I got to meet Alma Lance, the founder of Smart Girl, one of the founders of Smart Girl. I've read her material, I've read about her, and finally got to meet her. So that's always an excitement. Now what I'm going to tell her afterwards is we're going to change the name of the organization. I think it should be renamed Smart Women. So when you look at how crowded we are today, that didn't happen all by itself. And the, the staff, the volunteers, the committee people did an amazing job of PR and having, serving on many nonprofits myself and going through funding events and events such as this. There's a lot of nonprofits that could use their expertise. They did a phenomenal job. And you also have to give it up to Samin. Where's Samin? Raise your hand, Samin. She was on Colorado Public Radio this past week, did a phenomenal interview. Uh, check it out on the website for Smart Girl or Colorado Public Radio. She was articulate, expressive. You saw her in the video. Just tremendous. So I want to give her a round of applause. I would stop there somewhere. Now, today's topic is the teen brain starting in middle school. Keep in mind, this is going to be incredibly simplified to 45 minutes. Now, our brains have roughly 22 billion neurons and 150 trillion connections. Okay? So that makes our federal deficit look small in comparison. We have a massive job, and we're going to do it in 45 minutes, so everything's going to be fairly simplified, and I hope you can understand it in an easy, straightforward manner, and more importantly, help your teens understand it. Why starting in middle school? Why look at the brain starting in middle school? First of all, compared to infancy, the middle school brain experiences a massive growth. There will not be this much growth in our brains for the rest of our lives. So it's infancy, then again in those middle school years. Secondly, you've got to think about the average day of a middle schooler. They're in middle school, they're confronted with all these new things they've never really had to fully deal with. Puberty, right? How many boys are afraid that their voice is going to crack just as they're raising their hand to answer a question? Some of you men probably remember that. That's pretty embarrassing, right? Sexuality, dating, academics. We go from being sort of literal to now we're supposed to think in more complex ways. I recall myself in seventh grade, we read some poem in literature class that involved a, uh, a rose. And the teacher said, okay, children, now write a paragraph on two are two on what does that rose represent? Now the girls are diligently writing, and what do you think the girls might write? Love, harmony, inner flowering, okay? Me and the other guys in the class, it's a flower. Um, it's red. It's a red flower, right? Weren't quite ready for that jump. In a little bit, we're going to talk about one of the big differences between boys and girls is the girls are about 18 months to two years ahead of boys. So they're about two years, a year and a half, or two years ahead on this curve as we look at the brain. So they're dealing with all these new things, the social components, and it's all happening incredibly fast. They're trying to digest this stuff, and it's getting thrown at them, and they're trying to make sense of it all. One of my favorite quotes was by a sixth grade girl who I was doing a little lunch club at St. Anne's, this is years ago, and they had just had the puberty talk in the science curriculum, a mixed audience, boys and girls. And she came to the lunch club with about 20 of her classmates, and she said, Mr. Nippenberg, we had to talk about the P word. And I'm thinking, okay, sexuality, P, that could be a number of things. And I said, honey, well, what's that? And she said, you know, P plus enus. <laughs> and I thought, it's a new vowel. Enos, that's like part of it. We're going to add that to our grammar class, Enos, and absolutely just loved it. And you could see in her classmates were laughing. They're coming to grips with all these new things. Then finally, as I mentioned a second ago, most importantly, I, I'm a teen parent myself. I was hoping my son, he's 17, would be here today, but it is Colorado uh, ACT day. So uh, he's taking the ACT right now over to Rappo High School. But I'm a teen parent, and there are days when I'm sort of like a deer in the headlights. And I'm going, what happened? He was happy a second ago, and now he's mad. And did I change? And I'm like, no, I didn't change. I'm pretty sure he did. So any of you have parented teenagers, there are days where you're sort of like, whoa. 
Now, in my mind, if I can understand the brain and what's going on in their brains as a teacher or as a parent, I can be patient. I can take my time. I can bite my tongue. I can have patience. For our teenagers, there's some great research I'm going to talk about at the end. When they understand this stuff, it helps them be more understanding of themselves, and it helps them be more resilient. Finally, I did have a great experience today, right at St. Anne's this morning at 8 o'clock. I had a a group of middle schoolers, and we did this free association, which was invented by Sigmund Freud. And I said, okay, kids, I'm going to say a word, and then I want you to, to tell me the first word you think of, or some words you think of when I tell you this word. And, and you can do it to yourself. We, we don't have time to share it. But I wrote the word in the board, and I said, open your eyes. The word is popular. Okay? So take a second. Think what comes to your mind when you hear popular. Okay? So we brainstormed. We had about 20 different words up there, adjectives describing popular. Then I closed their eyes again and I said, okay, now we're going to do individual. Okay? So individuality. What comes to your mind? We again made the list 20 different things that they thought of. Now typically, which one do you think gets more positive adjectives? Uh, Popular. They're middle schoolers, right? So typically, in years past, 80% would be positive on popular, you know, friendly, uh, socializes, knows how to make friends. On the individual, there'd be words like nerd, loner, isolated, right? 80% negative. The class today is the most balanced I've ever had. They had some positives for popular, but they also had some negatives like mean, can exclude, might exclude others, right? Can't think for themselves. On the individual side, they had things like independent, strong, right? Leader. It's the best I've ever seen of a balance. And we talked about that's what it should be. You should have a balance of those two things. And those kids, especially those girls, have been through Smart Girl. And I was thrilled to see that kind of balance, that we're not just obsessed with contemporary culture and being popular. Now we're going to turn to the brain. We're going to talk about three brain areas today. We're going to start with your president of your brain. I tell kids this is your president, your frontal lobe. I had a little boy years ago, a kindergartner, went home and told his mom, Mom, George Bush is in my head. I said, no honey, he's not. The president, nobody has Obama in their head. But this is the president of our brain. This is going to control our behavior. It is the seat of behavioral control. It's impulse control paying attention, sustaining tasks, time management, organization, even movement control, body control, okay? Now, do three and four, three and four-year-olds, do they have much of a frontal lobe yet? Not so good. Uh, for girls, again, it's starting two years early, so the three-year-old girl's starting to have some of these skills and abilities. The boys are behind. If you go to any kindergarten class in the world, what are most of the girls doing? Their hair looks beautiful. They had lunch. They're sitting still. They raised their hand. What's the average boy doing? (laughs) Their hair's messy. They've got lunch on their shirt. They're sitting in the back. They blurt out the answers, right? The little five-year-old boy's brains just aren't there with the frontal lobe. Now, by about third grade, we want to have a basic, nice little frontal lobe that's controlling the rest of the brain. And our table down here is going to demonstrate that for us. So there's two parts to this you have to think about. First of all, we're going to have the brain cells of the third and fourth grader. Karen, through my wife here, there's four brain cells. And they, the brain cell communicates with a chemical. It's neurochemical. So a chemical gets passed between the cells to send the message. In this case, the message is going to be, pay attention to the speaker. Okay? So you all are middle schoolers in a classroom. Now, does the average middle schooler think about other things during class? Oh, yes, a whole lot of stuff, okay? And that little frontal lobe is supposed to say, pay attention. So now our third or fourth grader is going to get those messages, and they're going to pass a marker. Now, there's several neurochemicals at work. The main one is called dopamine. It's a substance called dopamine. Karen has two of them, and so she's going to pass. And if you can't see, you can't see, but they're passing around quickly. They're getting around. And another one. And there is our frontal lobe of our third or fourth grader. It's pretty speedy. 
that dopamine zips around, and it says, stay focused, pay attention. Now we've gone into puberty, and this frontal lobe is doubling in size. Now, it doesn't mean your kid's head is going to go like this, okay? It's just the branching inside. They're going to have a ton more brain cells. So our three uh, table mates here are going to come on over. When it's growing, those brain cells aren't wired up yet. They're not part of that little system that we had going. Eventually, they're going to be wired up, and we're going to have an incredible multitasking machine. But they're not wired up. So you're going to kind of scoot in there, and you're just kind of bumping around inside that frontal lobe. The second thing that happens for their brain is there's a drop in dopamine levels. So dopamine levels in adolescents drop in about half. So now we only have one marker that's going to make its way. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> She's a feisty brain cell. <laughs> Maybe I should pay attention. Does that sound like a middle schooler? Especially the boys. Any of you have boys are like, yes. Thank you very much. Give it up for me. So as that teen brain is growing and expanding, it's doubling in size. There's all these extra neurons. They're not part of the system yet. And there's this big drop in dopamine. So they're not, they have a hard time paying attention. They have a hard time staying organized. They really struggle with time management and impulse control. So think about some of your, the kids in your school, your sons or daughters, your own teenagers, or maybe yourself. I would challenge you, the question I ask the seventh graders at St. Anne's every year is, tell me something in the last year you've done that was really sort of foolish, that you thought to yourself, I guess I shouldn't have done that. And you're not even sure why you did, nor did you really think about the consequences, okay? Talking with a mother a little while back, she told me about her eighth grade son, who in the morning was rushed to get ready to school, and he can't find, he's, he's on the basketball team, can't find his basketball shoes. Now, who does he immediately start yelling at? His mom, right? It's your fault. I had him in the minivan, and I know you took him and moved him, right? Upset, has a big temper tantrum on the way to school. She was doing a great job. She said, honey, you'll have to deal with the coach. This is not my issue. This is yours. You're going to take, you'll have to talk to the coach practice today. Kid gets to school. Guess where the gym shoes are? on top of his locker. Now what had happened the night before, they went to the locker after school, he's diligently getting his books, putting his PE shoes up there, he's thinking maybe taking them home, play with his brothers that afternoon, puts them up there to take them home, and then maybe one of his buddies came over and said, hey, how's it going, man? And he grabs his books and his pack and off he goes. Where's the shoes? Top of the locker. One of my favorite in-class examples, seventh grade boy, he had a, a pen. It was from the Rockies. You know those bats that you get at the, the Rockies game, you get a baseball bat, it's about this long, and it has a pen in it. And this young man is sitting as I'm talking about this topic, and he's sitting there going, letting it go, like flicking it, flicking it, right? And all of a sudden, boom, hits him in the head. And he has this look of shock and awe. And I turned on and I said, well, what do you think would happen? I mean, if you're flicking a bat by your head, you're probably going to get hit, right? But do they think about that? No. I've done a couple studies. I just did a talk up in Montessori Evergreen on the whole Internet and sexuality and how those things are really causing a lot of problems. And I, and I mentioned two stories of middle school girls who made a decision to take a picture of themselves topless. And what did they do with that photo? They sent it to some boy. Now, in their heart of hearts, were they hoping he would keep it a secret? Yes. Were they anticipating that? Yes. And then what happened to those photos? They got sent around the entire school, right? Or several schools in a case in Oregon, okay? When those girls were interviewed, they were like, well, I didn't think that would happen, right? I didn't think that would happen. How many of your teenagers have said, Oh, I don't know why I did it. It was an accident, right? When my own son says it, I say, no, it wasn't an accident. It was the failure to use your frontal lobe. You did not think about the consequences of your behavior. And you have to do that as hard as it is. So during that adolescence period, you'll look up and on your own handouts, we have this scale of executive functioning. 
Now, the average female is about the 80th percentile. So for women, adult women, if we gave you a test, you'd be about the 80th percentile. The average male adult is about the 50th percentile. There are some survival reasons for that. Uh, it has to do, we, we need half of our species to, to be distractible. So if we were in the mountains and, and living as a little tribe in the mountains, little community, and there's wild animals out there, if every one of you is paying attention to me, what happens to some of our friends on the perimeter? They get eaten. Some mountain lion sneaks up and grab them. Now, if we have half our species are distractible, they hear a noise, they throw a spear, could they be the hero? Yes, they could, could save us all, unless it was their friend Bob who needed to go to the restroom. The problem in schools today, are there any wild tigers in the hallways? No. And boys often, again, struggle because they don't have that executive functioning. During adolescence, they all slide down. So that, that third or fourth grader is going to look like a 50 or 80th percentile. During this period of development, they all sort of slide down. Eventually, they're going to slide back up. Latest research I just heard last week. When I went to school, we were taught 18. Your frontal lobe was developed at 18. Then it was 25. The last I heard was they think females, it's about 24. And for guys, it's about 28. Okay? So us males are a little bit behind in this stuff. Now, it will speed up. It speeds up till you're about 35. So until about 35, there's this mylar sheathing that coats the brain cells. It gets faster and faster. You can multitask, do all these amazing stuff. Uh, after 35, I've got to tell you, you just go to bed sooner every night. Every night, you just go to bed earlier. That's how you deal with it. So they will get there, but during this time of growth and development, it's, be, be, it's being very difficult. Speed and spontaneity are your enemies. When we talk about parenting tips, we'll, we'll deal with that a little bit, that speed and spontaneity, they, teenagers are already fast enough. They don't need to be any faster. They don't need to be any more spontaneous than they already are. Uh, for those of you who do have middle school kids, the good news is the eighth grade girls, you'll see a jump in their brain development around the end of eighth grade. Uh, for boys, it's around the end of sophomore year in high school. So until about second semester sophomore years, high school boys are s still sort of junior high boys, right? They still have that silly junior high stuff going on, and they'll get there. So there is hope. Uh, for those of you who have middle schoolers, that you do see some jumps in development. Now, the second area we're going to talk about is the limbic system, which is this nice little chemical factory. So the easiest way to think about it is a little factory in your brain down here around the brain stem that's pumping out all these chemicals. And those chemicals are causing us to have different feelings. Last I read, I believe there's 300 different neurochemicals in our brains. Just an amazing. So this thing's pumping out chemicals. Now, some of you have kids, the little ones, who are like Winnie the Pooh. So I'll, teach you, I'll tell you my riddle I invented with the kids at St. Anne's. So Winnie the Pooh is walking through the forest, and he falls over a rock. And what does he say? He's laying on the ground. He says, oh, bother. And he looks up, and he says, but there's honey in that tree. So Winnie the Pooh has a little frustration, but he recovers quick, and he's looking for the bright side. Some of you have poos. Your kids are easy going, things don't go their way, and they know the phrase, you get what you get, and you don't pitch a fit, and they can do it. Now, if Piglet is walking through the forest and stumbles over a rock, Piglet would get all worried, and he'd say, I better go back home. I, there's going to be more rocks. I need to go home. And he would scurry back home. Piglet has a lot of anxiety. Now, one of the fourth graders said, Mr. Niffenberg, if you were four inches tall and pink and the wind blew, you would be nervous too. And I said, well, I, I guess I would, right? He's got anxiety, lots of anxiety. Rabbit. Rabbit's walking through the forest, falls over the rock. Rabbit would pick up that rock and say, stupid rock, and throw it, right? Rabbit is quick to anger. He's got a lot of anger. He's fine in his garden if he's by himself. If, if Tigger comes along, Rabbit is all a twixt, right? He's all upset, all angry. Now, if Eeyore came along and stumbled upon the rock, Eeyore would go, even the rock doesn't want to be my friend. So Eeyore struggles with melancholia and depression. Now, if Tigger fell over the rock, what would Tigger do? He'd say, that was great. I'm going to do it again. And he'd run around, and he'd keep doing it over and over and over again. He has got the excitement and the enthusiasm 
and he's pretty unleashed. Now, during this time of life, the emotional center of your teen's brain gets twice as active. So when you wire them up and you measure their emotional response, it is twice as much as a child or twice as much as an adult. They are very passionate creatures. If you read the Aristotle quote on the first page, he talks about they are vehement in expressing their desires. They are very intense creatures, and they literally have twice the emotions coming out of them. And then you think about that frontal lobe. That frontal lobe, when you have an emotion, the frontal lobe is supposed to say, stop, think about it. What should I do? How should I handle it? But if your frontal lobe's not there and you've got a whole lot of emotion coming off, out of you, do the emotions take control? Yes, and they change on a dime. I've got to tell you, there's days where you're just like, whoa, that's pretty creepy. It starts about fifth grade. You'll see that emotional shift and change. Now, the last part of this one I want to talk, if we could do the next slide, for females. So what I was talking about just now, that's for males and females both. For the females, we're going to do, again, simplified view of the hormone system. So there's a couple big players in the hormone system. There's lots of different hormones, and every woman is different. I was talking to my hairstylist about this on Monday, and she works at this very nice salon with lots of young women, and, she, and we were talking about the menstrual cycle and the moods and the emotions and the hormones, and she said, you know, there, there's some that it's a little more than, intense than others. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, that's true. So not every woman's the same. So you have to keep that in mind. This is simplified. But, oh, we lost it. For the first two weeks in the cycle, estrogen levels are high. Estrogen really promotes what we're going to talk about next, nonverbal processing. It helps with social skills. Their verbal skills are higher. This would be the time for girls to take the ACT uh, or the SATs. This is the time they should take the test during the first two weeks of their cycle. Okay? Estrogen levels are high. Estrogen is what makes women incredible. It's the stuff us guys love about women is all that estrogen. Now, around day 14 after ovulation, estrogen drops and progesterone cranks up. Progesterone dampens the whole system. So during week three, uh, one of my graduate students did this for me. She talked about it's sort of like a weed killer. It just kind of knocks everything out. Uh, there's less focus so we're not, women aren't as focused during that time. There's increased stress and sensitivity. That progesterone is dampening down the system. And then she artistically drew the fourth week and sort of this whole collapse of the whole system and some hostility and anger and really being out of sorts or struggling with some negativity and depression. Now, my wife talked about with a group of, of girls at Denver Academy the other day about the two-day rule. And she said, ladies, if you have to make a big decision in your life, whether to break up with a boyfriend or whether to be upset with your friend and you're thinking of rejecting that friend, think at least two days, okay? Because if you're in the sec those, that third week or the fourth week, could you make an impulsive decision based on your emotions? Yes. If you wait a couple days, you're probably going to make a better decision. I also, for you parents, I love the idea of the 14-day rule. If you need to have a big discussion with your daughter, Okay, and you're talking about extended curfews or the boyfriend she's dating or prom's coming up, do it during the first two weeks. If you do it days one through 14, you'll probably have a nice conversation and she'll be that little girl that she was when she was younger and you're going to feel good about your conversation. If you wait till after that, you're probably pushing your luck and then you're probably going to have the slamming doors and the drama and all this extra stuff. And males are capable of that too, so I don't want to be moaning just females. Males can certainly slam doors, i got to tell you. That happens as well. But that's a short and simple look at sort of the hormone system and how that impacts the teen female. Now, the third area of the brain, if we could go to the next slide, is what's called nonverbal processing. So, quick question for all of you. You were assigned to your tables today, so you got a little note that said, here's the table you're at. But when you came to your table, what did you quickly have to figure out? Which seat, okay? Now, some of you picked a seat because you thought, well, I want to face the audience. I don't like to have to turn around. You might have thought, I want to be my, by my friend. Uh, now, you, you might have a social situation where you think, oh, I, I don't want to see that person. I'll sit here so I don't have to face that person, right? So it could be for that reason. Uh, you might want to sit in the front or fr towards the front of the table. 
again, or you might want to meet new people. So you're trying to schmooze a little bit, and you figure, oh, that person's with that business, so I'm going to sit by them. There's a lot of reasons why we pick our seats. Now, how, how much time does your brain have to do that? Two seconds, okay? Now, imagine you're a middle schooler, and you're going into your class, and you hear the teacher say, okay, children, it's open seating, take your seats. Do they have to think about where they sit? Yes, and they get about two seconds to decide. Now, if you sit down next to the most popular girl in the school, who always sits next to Susie, and you're sitting there, what kind of look are you going to get? <sighs> Loser, right? And, and then that boy is like, sorry, and he shuttles off. Should I sit next to the kid that bullies me? Probably not, right? If I'm interested in a boy or a girl, where should I sit? Should I sit right on top of her, like hovering over her? Or should I sit a little further away, but so as to make eye contact with her, right? Those are basic social skills. It's learning to be leaders, learning to be politicians. Another one I heard Samin say, and you can all do it, bully me with your eyes. So look at me right now and make a bully look at me, right? There's some good ones out here, okay? I think I just got shot with arrows. Can you do that with your eyes? Can you bully someone? Yes. That's called nonverbal communication, nonverbal processing. The middle school brain is exploding with nonverbal communication. You go down any middle school hallway. How many of you have been down a middle school hallway during break time when they're all in there? How many of you have been afraid? You're like, oh my God, the prisoners are out and there's no guards. And there's all this smack talking back and forth. Eventually, these kids are going to be our leaders. There's a John Hickenlooper over at one of our middle schoolers right now, okay? But the, the analogy I like is learning social skills at this age is like taking a juggling lesson. And on your first lesson, the instructor gives you a set of steak knives and says, okay, juggle these. Are you going to get cut? Yes. Are you going to cut the people around you? Yes, right? Now, the good news is for 99% of the people, this is a phase. They're going to outgrow it. Some don't. Uh, but most are going to outgrow this. But for a period of time, it's not real attractive. Again, if you look at the scale, about if you did a test for women, they're going to hit about the 80th percentile in social skills. The average guy is about the 50th percentile. If you look at the average uh, engineering guy, he's probably about the 20th percentile. Okay. Now, for you women in the room that have a partner, you're married, and you've looked at your husband and you said, you don't understand how I feel, do you? Guess what? He doesn't. He really doesn't. Males process emotions lower in the brain. The term is they don't tend to rise up to consciousness as much, nor do we nearly, we don't think about so much of it. The area of the brain called the corpus callosum, which transfers information, that's that top picture, it transfers information between the hemispheres, and it creates in the right hemisphere this, this perfect picture of where you should sit. It's smaller in men. It's also powered by estrogen. So when estrogen levels are high, women are just noticing all these things and putting together all these pieces and feeling emotions and discussing it with their friends, right? Just an incredible process. It's an amazing uh, skill. Now, again, they're going to outgrow it. But if you put those three things together, you get one of my favorite terms, teen angst. So if you think about the average teenager, they have happiness, they have excitement, but then minutes later it's sorrow and pain and anger and jealousy and rage and love, and it's just all up and down, they're swirling around during this phase of their life with all three of those brain components together. The emotions are supercharged, the frontal lobe can't stop them, the frontal lobe doesn't think about the consequences of what they do, and then that nonverbal pro process comes in and says, well, just give her a look. Or, or spread a rumor about her, do some gossiping about her. That'll pay her off, right? It's a giant mess. Now, teenagers are often prone to doing things that make them feel better in the moment and give them control, but ultimately adds more angst. So if any of you have ever spread a rumor or done some gossiping, how does it feel when you're doing it? It feels great. Now, later, when those rumors come around to you, how does it feel? Not so good. When a guy starts driving his car and he's in control, how does he feel of that car? Incredible.
but when he's had a wreck because he was racing, his buddy or his friend died because he was racing, how does he feel then? Lots more angst. What we're hoping to do for our teenagers is help them direct all that energy into shooting stars. So out of chaos comes a shooting star. And we hope in their in ath- academics, athletics, arts, sciences, music, charity work, volunteer work, that's what you want to direct your teenagers to doing and keep them busy. Idle hands are not good for this stage of brain development, okay? They don't necessarily just sit and meditate very well, occasionally, but not too often. So you want to keep them moving and hopefully creating shooting stars. Now some quick parenting tips I've put on there. First of all, bite your tongue. The sign of a good teen parent is the number of teeth mark in your tongue. You cannot take on every issue with them. You will lose. You will hopelessly lose. There's so many times I just walk away quietly and I say to myself, it's only a phase. Or I have on occasion said, I know you have a feeling of control right now, but truly it's an illusion. There is no control by berating your father. That really is not going to lead to a shooting star. Okay? So you've got to bite your tongue and be patient. Slow down and provide structures. If you ask me what's the biggest change in families now from 30 years ago when I started, we're all too fast. We have too much going on. It's much too fast. And technology has ratcheted up 100 times. So now, instead of having to wait till you got home to ask your parents if you could go out on Friday night, you can do it right now. And your mom or your dad is probably busy, and if you know they're busy and you can get them right away and you ask them, can I do this, or coach says I need a new lacrosse set, I have to have it today, what's mom or dad probably going to say? Okay, you know, I, I don't want to get the coach to be upset with you. And when you go shopping for the lacrosse set, the kid's going to tell you which one to buy. The cheap one? No, the most expensive. And you're busy running around, do you have time to think about it? No. Slow them down, lots of structure. Rules should be set all through high school. Here's your curfew, here's when you drive, here's your use of computer, here's your use of TV. If you do this with your phone, here's what happens. You do this, here's what happens. And I'm going to check your phone. I'm going to look, in middle school, you should be checking those emails. You, you have a no delete rule. You do not delete anything. Only the parents can delete stuff off of there. Because if you let them delete, are you going to miss out on what's really happening? Right? There's, it's all going on. So it's lots of structure, slowing them down, electronic rules. Show you believe in them and talk about this stuff. I talked to Edric up here, and he said, I've got a big challenge as a parent next month. My daughter's 15th birthday, I think he said, coming up. I got her concert tickets to some famous star. I've never even heard of her. Um, for her and her friend to go without any adults. He said, I'm pretty nervous. And I said, you are. It's like the first day my son drove to school. And as he pulled out, I wanted to say those words. Call me when you get there. But I didn't. And I didn't do it because I wanted him to believe that I believe in him. I trust him. He can make good decisions. Now, was I nervous for 20 20 minutes when he was driving? You bet. Edric's going to be sitting there for four hours at this concert, just going, oh my gosh, I hope she's okay. You've got to trust them. You've got to show that you understand this stuff and help them understand it. Wonderful research out of the University of Stanford. A young psychology student looked at if you taught students about their brains and what's going on in their brains, how does it affect them? They saw a 40% increase in resiliency because the victims of the middle school stuff realized, oh, I'm not going to be a victim my whole life. It's a phase. And the people that were doing the victimization Realize, yeah, I, I was out of sorts. I made a bad choice. It's going to be fine. I can make it through this phase. You want to help them understand. It truly is a phase and help them understand their, their brains. Promoting insight. The goal of good discipline with your kids. One goal is to get them to stop a behavior or start a behavior. But the other goal is to get them to think about their behavior and how it makes others feel. So with your teen and your children. They mess up, you take away the phone for a week, they take away the car for a week. If they talk with you and you have a nice, insightful discussion about their behavior and why they did it, you cut their consequence in half. After three days, they get the car back, they get the phone back. If they don't talk with you or show insight, you double it. They lose it for two weeks. You push insight. You're always trying to get them to think more. Finally, connect through adventure. The point of Adventure Dad is to get dads out there and moms. We have some Adventure Moms on the site connecting with your kids. Guess what you don't take along on your adventures? 
electronics, right? You're out there connecting, you're spending time together, you're doing new things. I would tell all of you with your middle schoolers and teenagers, sit down with them and ask them five things they want to do in the next five or six years. Five or six adventures, could be scuba diving, uh, all sorts of things, camping, it could be indoor stuff too, it doesn't have to be outside. Go-karting, there's all sorts of fun things that adventures to be had with your kids. And, and it's about getting out there and doing with it, getting away from the cell phones, getting away from the friends for a while, and being present with them and truly connecting with them. The last thing I tell you, just from a basic health standpoint, our teenagers are chronically overfatigued. They're so tired. My son is tired all week long on the weekends, he'll sleep. Sometimes I think he just passes out for like two or three hours, he'll sleep. Your kids need sleep at this age. Their brain needs sleep. And, and to be honest, they have way too much homework. They really need to be resting and sleeping. Finally, on a, on a more serious note before we move on, I think about the role of smart girl with all this, and I think about maybe one middle school girl who's feeling excluded. So the image would be she's sitting in a dark room all alone, okay? How would that feel? Now, with smart girl, she gets to talk about these things. She, she meets a near peer, and that near peer provides her with a candle and another person in that room with her. How does she feel now? Fabulous. It makes all the difference for that girl. On even a more serious note, programs like Smart Girl help our kids, and with the boys now that we're developing in St. Anne's, good decision-making, good choices, making good choices. I unfortunately was involved with Columbine 12 years ago. It was really difficult. And since then, I've done a lot of reading and research on it all. One of my favorite studies was a research study that looked at school shootings that were prevented. So they looked at where someone was going to hurt somebody with a gun, and they were stopped. In 90% of the school shootings that were prevented, guess who said something? A girl. A girl said something to their parents, to their teacher, their friends. They made smart choices. They got help. Your support here today and your support of Smart Girl helps our girls and our boys make good choices. Those good choices make it safer for all of our kids. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it very much.